This is the Serrano Brothers Podcast. Hi, friends. Welcome back. Um, we are the Serrano Brothers, and today we have with us the Reverend Sarah Wilson. Um, as a reminder, we've kind of made it our mission on the Serrano Brothers Podcast that we are interviewing pastors and lay leaders and and all kinds of people because we want to connect the Sierra Pacific Synod. And um, Sarah is kind of new to the Sierra Pacific Synod, <laughs> but like not really. Like like, but she's back. Not new. <laughs> oh, you're back is what I should say, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sarah is back. That's how we're gonna put it. Um, right. <laughs> all right, Sarah. We want to get to to know you a little bit better. Uh, so, so tell us about yourself. Where are you from? Um, what does your family look like? Uh, let's start there. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. It is good to be back in Northern California. Um, I grew up in Wisconsin, and after college, joined AmeriCorps, and that's how I got to California. And so I was in Salinas at an HIV AIDS organization for four years as a grant writer uh, before I went to seminary. My family um, is still mostly in Wisconsin. Uh, I have two brothers, a sister, and my dad are still there. I do have an aunt and a couple of cousins in California, which is great uh, for the holidays. Uh, but otherwise, it's just me and my friend's family, and I'm really happy with that. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Uh, do you have your favorite favorite childhood memory? Um, I do. You know, when we, so when I was seven, my family moved from one part of Wisconsin to the other, and that meant that we got to have about 21 acres and a small farm. And so we got things like horses. And so one of my favorite childhood memories is every summer from about the time when I was 10 to 16, uh, we would take our horses. And I think once I took my beef cow flower uh, to the Columbia County Fair, and it was just a week of fun with my friends and my four-legged pets. You took a cow to the county fair? Yeah, I did. <laughs> did you rib it at all? Did you get any, any kind of prize? Did you win anything? Of course she did. She was the best one. <laughs> oh, that's such a cool thing. Is this yeah, one of those things well, where you like take her to the fair and you sell her? Okay, so actually this is a fun fact that I did not ever think about, but Flower was a twin. Um, and... <laughs> And um, so our neighbor, had her, one of his cows had twins and the mom couldn't take care of both. And so uh, Earl asked if we would take flour. So we got flour and we bottle fed flour and she became kind of like a puppy dog. And then she just was our pet forever. And so we took her to the county fair Mostly just because she was a joy to have around, not because she was the best of her show or anything. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah, it was really fun. I did take a spear one year and sell it um, in the auction, and it was really hard. I never wanted to do that again. Yeah. I have a love for county fairs, Sarah. Like I love, I know they're like nowhere like the Midwest, but anytime they come here, like the Alameda or even like going to Sacramento for the state fair, I just, I just have a love of going to like those kind of things, you know, <laughs> I'm going to try a Midwest one sometime. <laughs> you should. They're the best. Lots of cheese curds. <laughs> cheese curds. Awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Cheese curds are a hard no for me after visiting <laughs> Seattle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Sarah, what do you do outside of the church? Like, what what kind of hobbies do you have? Uh, what do you, yeah, any passions, you know, not related to your ministry? Yeah, that's another good question. I have lots of interests. I'm, you know, I just moved to Northern California about 
two months ago. And so I'm trying to figure out how to make more time for things like um, I walk every day, but I really enjoy combining sightseeing and walking. So hmm. going and finding uh, the state parks, the national parks, the county parks, uh, the local sites. I really enjoy finding the local coffee shops and trying to find the best cup of coffee coffee in every town that I visit or live in. Um, I also really enjoy gardening, but I haven't figured out how to do much of that uh, now that I'm living in a place without a very big yard. So mm -hmm. I may soon explore um, more container gardening, or I don't know if you've seen like the TikTok videos with the like indoor growing units where you can like grow your own lettuce inside and stuff. So I might experiment with things like that soon. That's cool. The, the hydroponics, I think, is one of the yeah, the name for that. Yeah. We we are in the middle of Lent right now. Uh, do you have any like spiritual disciplines that you're holding on to this Lent? I do. Um, so I decided to take up the practice of gratitude card writing this year. And so every day um, I choose someone to pray for and to write a handwritten gratitude card and then mail it. Um, so that's been my personal practice. I've been leading my congregation through this year. We set up a table in the back of our sanctuary where people can gather around it um, and they can write prayers that then I will pray during the week. And I also um, printed off some extra prayer resources for them to take home. That's nice. I like that. Yeah. One of the things I do, uh, uh, Pastor Sarah is is we have our connection cards like the pew cards right, and I tell people because I do uh, uh, that I use these and I pray for people every Monday. So if they have if they put their name on a on a pew card or a connection card, I pray for them. Um, mm. Yeah, and more people start started filling it out. By the way, when I told them that. <laughs> That's a good idea, Jeremy. I like that. Yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, you uh, did you grow up Lutheran? Did how? I did grow up Lutheran, sort of. So what I mean by that is, is that my mom grew up Lutheran, and my great grandfather was the Lutheran pastor in the small town of Medford, Wisconsin, where she grew up. Um, he died before I was born, so I didn't get to know him. My mom was not part of a church for many years, like while she was working and before she got married. So when my parents got married, and I'm the oldest of the, um, the three of us, uh, my parents decided to join the ELCA as it was becoming the ELCA. Oh, and okay. so, I mean, in 1988, I was in kindergarten. So almost a lifelong Lutheran. Indeed. Um, your, how, how did we meet, Sarah? Did we meet in seminary? It's been so long. I feel like I've known you for so long that I, I was it seminary that we, we all met? We did all meet in seminary. So Josh oh. and I met first in 2009 because Josh was doing his Lutheran year, and I was in my first year of seminary. Jeremy, you and I technically graduated together, but I don't think that we really connected much until after graduation when you were getting your first call and I was beginning my work with Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary because our paths kind of did this um, right. because you were taking classes while I was on internship. That's right. That's right. Now, now th that's a great segue into um, you are a pastor, and where do you currently serve? I am a pastor currently serving Grace Lutheran Church in Lincoln, California. And and for everybody who doesn't know where Lincoln is, it, where is that at? So Lincoln is about thirty to thirty-five miles. Uh, 
north and east of Sacramento. Uh, it's basically due north of Roseville. And, but but in addition to that, you have this for probably what ten years now. Worked for Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary. Yes, so I'm serving as a bivocational shared time ministry pastor. Um, so I've been serving PLTS. Uh, it's actually going to be 11 years on June the 1st. Wow. And wow. I've been serving Cal Lutheran almost as much time. You know, the seminary and the university merged on January 1st, 2014. Um, so my current role is I serve as the director of seminary stewardship. Uh, so I do that about three quarter time. And then I serve the congregation about 15 to 20 hours a week. And what does it look like to do seminary? Let's talk about the, the seminary first, and then we'll talk about the church. Uh, wh what does that mean? That, what do you do for them? So I do a couple of things. So I'm a major gift fundraising officer. So I manage and oversee the fundraising for the seminary program. And I do that as a part of Cal Lutheran's Division of University Advancement. Uh, so there's a whole team of us that do this work together. Um, I also, along with Colleen Wyndham Hughes at Cal Lutheran, we um, oversee the, the relationship with the larger church. And so things like coordinating um, our presence at synod assemblies across regions one and two of the ELCA. So one thing that I do is I creates, um, a, you know, I lead a team who creates the strategy for our presence at those synod assemblies. And because of a number of factors, including the pandemic, you know, we're looking at ways of doing that both in person, but also like, how do we get to the assemblies that are either meeting for one day or, you know, there's times when we have four assemblies on one weekend and, mm -hmm. you know, it's just not possible to get to them all. So how do we show up in hybrid ways? Uh, um, why do you all do well, do you all venture outside of region two or do you pretty much keep it there? Yeah, great question. So we venture out for church wide things and other faith and spiritual based reasons. Also, every once in a while with my fundraising work, I will venture outside the region. The reason that we talk a lot about our regional territories is the ELCA decided long ago to divide up the regions um, to each seminary and each ELCA college and university as a way of helping to form those more local partnerships and also I'll just, you know, kind of be frank about it, like to take out the competitiveness of it. So hmm. the good part about it is, is that all 11 synods in regions one and two uh, support the seminary with prayers, encouragement, and financial support hmm. uh, monthly or quarterly. Like it's like they have a line item in their budget to support the seminary. And it's like that for all seven seminaries. Um, so that's why we divide the regions. Um, that's really cool. That that's a really great uh, way of doing it, you know, and uh, uh, a way to foster, you know, uh, local connections. You know, even though region one and two is really big, it, it's still local to us, right? Like, <laughs> you know, yeah, uh, it, so it, it, it is really big. I will. You know, I'll say we share region one with Luther Seminary. So that's mm -hmm. also interesting because we have, I mean, there are some things that we partner with Luther Seminary on. That's cool. Um, and also Wartburg on one of our programs. So. That, that, that's great. What is it? What do you love about your job at, at the seminary? I love the people. I love the connection of uh, money following mission and serving the church and mm. being able to do that both as a pastor and a philanthropy professional. I've always felt like my job is about like bringing people together, but also connecting people for the sake of the mission of the church and the seminary. 
Yeah. Do you find that people are, um, are really like, I, I, how do I want to say this? Uh, uh, are they like, how invested are they in the seminary? Like how, like, how does that, how, how excited are they when they give however amount they, they give? Is that, do you uh, like talk about the, I guess the connection between like donors and the seminary? Uh, People love the seminary because they love their congregation and they love their church and they love their pastor and they want to be able to have that space for the perpetual future. Yeah. Um, people love PLTS and they support the larger church and our programs to the point that sometimes, um, and we've had a couple of really uh, big impact gifts in the last couple of years where this is like people's dream come true. Like they've worked hard all of their lives you know, in their own vocation. And this is one way where they can like make a real difference in the life of the church and in the life of our students. Mm. That's beautiful. You know, Jeremy and I both went to church with a, a guy who uh, was a big contributor to, to CLU. Uh, in fact, I think his name's on the chapel. Uh, Bob Samuelson was his name. Uh and uh, I just I just remember this guy. He like uh, apparently I did not know this was super wealthy, but also Jeremy needed new carpet in his office in the youth room. The guy was pounding carpet for Jeremy. This was, this guy was, was like, like eighty years old. <laughs> I'm, I'm like Bob, what are you doing, man? Like like because he was like tiny and like you know he was a working man his entire life, so his joints were stiff. And he's down there with a darn knee kicker, tightening carpet up. I'm like, Bob, why don't you have your guys do this? And, and, and he was like, and rob myself of the joy of serving the youth in my congregation. And I was like, oh my gosh, this guy is so wonderful. I mean, that's just such a, he was such a beautiful <laughs> man. He really was. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I just, I just love to hear stories like, like, I mean, it's, People give joyfully to the church, right? They give. Can you tell you any know, stories about that? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know, I don't know what the protocol is. Can you tell any stories about giving? Yeah, I can. Um, I think I'll just try to change the names um, if I need to. Yeah, you know, people love this. You know, I remember a couple years ago, um, I was visiting one of our alum pastors and his wife, and we were having breakfast and they were telling me about you know all their travels and their time all across the world um you know which church he started with but then how he ended up in international ministry and um his passion for uh the earth and the environment and how you know they didn't have any children and they were trying to figure out like you know, where and how they can make the most impact. And they had decided to focus on the institutes of higher education that mm. they both had gone to school at. And so we had a conversation about um, how they could make a big impact gift uh, with their values and also that would make a real difference in the life of the seminary uh, coming up in the next probably a few years, uh, but we never know. Because in this instance, it was a planned gift conversation. And I can circle back to what that means in a moment. Uh, but in this situation, that breakfast conversation became a commitment to a half a million dollar gift for the seminary, for the wow. Center for Climate Justice and Faith, in wow. honor of one of their beloved seminary professors. Like that's how much of a difference the seminary is making in the world. Right. Wow. That's that's amazing to me. I mean, that's like, like wow. Yeah. Very cool. Very. Cool. And people, I mean, it seems like so. That's like a planned gift. So after they pass away, is that what I'm hearing? Uh, yes. Yeah. I I mean, there's so planned giving, legacy giving. They mean the same thing. Mm -hmm. Estate planning. Um. 
yes in this case like it's a planned gift but there's like different ways that you can make a planned gift and so yes um this gift will come uh after they pass away wow that's really great that's all right there what would it cost me if i want the the jeremy serrano chair of awesome <laughs> theology <laughs> oh now you're gonna make me give a number which, <laughs> i don't know if i should do but this this is what i will say so um so when we endow funds this is how it works so we imagine you know a big pool of a bank account and then within that bank account there's different funds and so the way that it works Typically, is is that the minimum amount to endow anything um, is twenty five thousand dollars. You're asking about like a chair, so to fully fund a faculty position. I mean, at this point, is probably two and a half to three and a half million dollars because wow. yeah. the way we calculate it is is that we take um, a t uh, twelve quarter. No, a three quarter rolling average, 12 quarter rolling average, I think it is, and it's a 5%. So whatever the balance is in there over 12 quarters gets averaged together, and then we use 5% of that. So in a perfect world, we would only be spending interest. Right. right. Yeah, that that's sense. cool. Yeah. 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 Do you do you have any numbers on like how many alum give to PLTS? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we have around four hundred fifty to five hundred total alumni, and every year it's pretty high statistically. Yeah. It's about one third that make at least one gift. Yeah. Well, you yeah. You, you have a. I remember. Uh, I mean, you you have groups of students calling out, don't you? So we used to. What you're remembering is the phone-a-thon, which was loads of fun. Um, I would have a couple students get together with me at PLTS. Uh, we would order pizza, and we would make phone calls for like three or four hours. Um, I, the pandemic was one reason why we stopped the phone-a-thon, but also like everybody has cell phones nowadays with caller ID. And so what we found is people didn't actually want to answer those phone calls. And so we've decided to invest the time into other ways of fundraising, namely uh, digital philanthropy. Ooh, ooh. Cool. That's cool. I remember you trained somebody really well because I was like, no, 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 no. And then I gave money. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, wait, how did, how did that happen? I mean, I can find somebody to call you, Jeremy. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> You're good at your job, Sarah. You're good. <laughs> there you go. Right, oh. let's, let's, wait, is there anything else you... you, you Want to tell us about the seminary or you want to tell our listeners? So something that is very exciting is, is that we've doubled the number of students at the seminary in the last two years. Whoa. That's and impressive. And this is how we've done it. So we have three relatively new certificate programs and we are, they are open to both students in seminary rostered leaders and lay leaders. So there's a Center for Climate Justice and Faith and uh, new this year is that in addition to the English certificate, we also offer a Spanish language certificate. Mm. Uh, we also launched uh, a racial justice and faith certificate and Dr. Moses Penamaca, who directs our team program, which is an alternative path um, to be a rostered leader. Um, he is launching a new certificate, Theological Education for Indigenous Leaders. And so when we take those things together, along with the fact that we've made the Master of Divinity, which is quote unquote, the traditional pathway 
uh, to become a pastor, we've made that hybrid. So, um, and it's asynchronous. So a person can choose either the residential program or the distance learning option. That has helped us grow the enrollment of the seminary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's cool. That's really cool. I like, I like, I, it's it's cool how much the diversity in which uh, the programs are set up, you know, and and um, that's that's really interesting. All right, let's change lanes here to to your to your ministry at church. Um, you're doing this really cool thing um, with campers. Uh, is that the right term? Is a camper a right term? I prefer camper. Um, the congregation calls them trailers because our members are campers and travelers. So we call them RV trailers is what they are. Our, actually, I feel like that's a really good name for an RV trailer, um, but I'm used to camper. Tell us about the RV trailers that on your church property. Yeah, happy to. Um, so... Grace Lutheran Church decided to partner with the city of Lincoln uh, to try to help solve uh, the homeless crisis. And so Grace Lutheran Church is part of a one-year pilot program. And so it, last fall, uh, the city of Lincoln uh, paid to uh, grade a part of our property and they put in utilities and then they had received grant money to purchase the brand new RV camping trailers. And so they just have had them sitting somewhere basically in storage. And um, so we have two of them on our property now and they are providing a home to someone who previously did not have one. And part of the program is, is that, you know, there's a whole like application process. Um, so we get to know the folks who are going to be living in them, but then there's a whole support that happens that is offered to the people who are accepted into the program. And so it's like every week, members of the church, along with staff from the city, are meeting with these folks and supporting them for things like finding jobs, getting the medical care that they need. Uh, over the last couple of weeks, we actually added, um, they built a dog run um, so okay. that their dogs would have a place to be outside when they, you know, go out grocery shopping or to job interviews and things. Um, so it's a really, I think it's an innovative way uh, to give people a place to live, to support them in, um, you know, getting to the next step in their life. But it's also a really interesting partnership to have the church work with the city. You know, mm. sometimes we talk about how the, you know, we need to keep church and state separate. And I think this is an example of why that's, that's not true because of the good work that can happen um, for our neighbors in need. Right. And, it, and my understanding is that the state and research shows that, you know, the idea is to get people housed first and then try to get them integrated into, you know, um, more uh, integrated into jobs and help and stuff like that. But but the first thing to do is try to get them a place to live uh, as as a stepping stone uh, to to be integrated into society, you know. Right. We did it during the pandemic, didn't we? Right. Yeah. <laughs> All the hotels and stuff. Yeah. Right, exactly. Right. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Uh, what else is your church know? doing that you love? You know, I just, I love that. They love being church together. And, you know, they, um, their transition time was really long. Their pastor retired about five and a half years ago, and then they okay. did, you know, go through an interim period, but then the pandemic happened, and they decided as a church that they weren't going to call another interim, rush a call process, or go online, yeah. and so what I love about this group of people is, is that they are 
rooted in their faith. They are excited about church, but they've also, because they have, you know, almost double the life experience that I do. So they're in, most of them are in their seventies and their eighties. They also go at the pace of life and they're, Mm -hmm. you know, okay Mm -hmm. with like that discernment of, this is where we feel called and this is what we're excited about, you know, finding that place to put their energy and then being okay with letting go and saying no to other things, Mm -hmm. you know, and in addition to that, they're willing to try new things. And what has been, you know, a huge gift to me is, is that nine times out of 10, when I ask them if they want to do something or want to try something, they say yes. That's lovely. That's great. Um, it's it's just it's been awesome. I mean, right now during Lent, we're partnering with uh, the local Episcopal Church, St. James Episcopal Church, um, who has also been in a very long time of transition, and they don't have a priest. Uh, so they started worshiping together during the pandemic. And so they've just continued it. And so like Ash Wednesday, St. James came over to Grace. And now on Wednesdays uh, during Lent, uh, we're going to St. James on Wednesday evenings for soup supper and Bible study. And then during Mm -hmm. Holy Week, uh, St. James will come over to Grace and worship with us. So I just, to me, like, you know, it's a huge gift um, to have a group of people that's excited to be church together and excited to discover what God is, you know, trying to do um, with our congregation. That's really cool. It's really cool that you're partnering in that way, you know, and, and that your church sees the value in in going to another place. It's not just your church saying, oh, they all got to come here, you know, uh, that, that you truly partner in that way. That's, that's a, it's a great thing. Yeah. yeah I was being funny. out. Go ahead. But, no. no, I was just going to say it was funny because yesterday we had our annual meeting and afterwards I was talking with someone about St. James and they just, it was like almost immediate. It was like, well, they have a fellowship hall. Like we love to worship over there. And I, I was like, it was just kind of a, a thing for me that was like, oh, like it is like actually more about church for this group of people than it is about the building at all. And I just, I love that. That's really cool. And your church is really adorable. (laughs) I mean, it's it's like, it's like a country church. It's like a, like a one room schoolhouse almost. (laughs) Right. I mean, was there, I mean, that's it, right? Like the building that we were in for your, for your installation, that, that's the only building you all have, right? Yes. So Grace Lutheran Church is located about a half a block off of the main drag, uh, Lincoln Boulevard through Lincoln. Um, so what that gives us is a really nice location and then, you know, a visibility for the community. Um, the blessing and the challenge of it is, is that, you know, it's, it's a remodeled house. So, you know, imagine what used to be a two or three bedroom house. And so the sanctuary part, like you walk in the door and there's one bathroom to the right. There's one room that's currently storage. There's a very small kitchen, you know, a small narthex and then a sanctuary that you can configure to seats, you know, 80 to 100 people, but on an average week, we have about 60 chairs in there. And then upstairs, uh, there's two small rooms, which are offices, um, and a second bathroom. So the gift of it is, is like, it feels very homey, because it is a house. The challenge of it is, is that, you know, it would be nice, um, you know, at times to have more space, have a classroom, uh, have, you know, a fireside room, have a fellowship hall. Um, but I, yeah. I love it. And we have this, you know, big like backyard too. And so 
it's very weather, cool when the weather cooperates it um you know it'd be great to do more things outside too mm. totally it's a it's a sweet little place i love it i love it yeah 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 um all right here's a, a theological question for you sarah pastor sarah reverend sarah <laughs> how do you explain the gospel to people The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. It is both historical as written, but also the gospel is meant to be the good news for you in your life today and in this moment. The mm. gospel is meant to be a word of love and grace for you and in your life. Amen. Amen to that. Amen to that. Is there anything else you want, you want us to know about your ministry? Um, Both at, at PLTS, CLU, and, and at Grace? Yeah, I think I would just, you know, share that I'm really excited about this creative way that uh, PLTS and Cal Lutheran, Grace Lutheran Church, and the Sierra Pacific Synod um, have all chosen to support you know, I think, you know, the way that, you know, the church is going, I think more and more, you know, those of us who are pastors, we're going to have to be creative um, because, mm -hmm. you know, I know for myself, like I really wanted to say yes to the call to grace. But as I was in discernment with them, I could not bring myself to, you know, ask them to support a full time uh pastor i mean we worship you know an average of 25 to 32 people on a weekend so i think you know these ways that we can find to be bivocational without burning out um i think this is the future of the church and you know i find especially during the weeks where i can find that balance and you know juggle well between the two it is really life-giving, you know, to be rooted in a congregation and to be able to pastor them and pastor with them and be church in the linking community, but then also to be able to do this other thing that also gives me joy, which happens yeah. to be philanthropy. Mm. That's, that's awesome. Mm. Love it. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing all of that. Um, you know, at the end of our interviews, we like to give some rapid fire questions uh, to you. So don't think about it too much. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's like 10 questions. And uh, just say what the first thing that comes to your mind, okay? okay. You ready for this? Yeah. All right, cool. All right, what food could you eat every day? Ice cream. What's your favorite movie genre? I like comedies. Right. Uh, salty, sweet, or savory? Oh, I've never heard that question asked that way. I'm going to go with savory. Nice. In addition to the Bible, which book would you bring with you on a deserted island? My journal. What fills your cup? Uh, sea and the ocean. Mm -hmm. What depletes your cup? Lack of communication. Mm. What is your favorite holy place? It's a toss up. I have two Yosemite National Park and anywhere with a big body of water. Mm. What was one piece of good advice that you've been given? Trust the process. Mm. What does rest look like for you? Rest looks like um, a few minutes every day to just pause, to breathe, and to be outside. Mm. 
Mm. Yep. On that last day, when you enter heaven, what do you hope God will say to you? I love you. Everybody, this is the Reverend Sarah Wilson. Thank you so much for joining us.